qualifying when the conditions were bearable, uh, but it started wet and it got drier, but the lap timers were of meaning. But the first free practice session was a virtual washout yesterday with yeah. so much rain and a red flag. I mean, they were running 23 seconds a lap slower. Yeah. It was literally a matter of more like uh, navigating your way around the circuit than it was actually driving your way around. And particularly here, this is, you see in the background, the Silverstone wing, which is the home essentially of everything at Silverstone, bar the Formula One, well, the Grand Prix is based there. Everything else seemingly prefers to operate out of the old Silverstone Formula One pits. But that part of racetrack, the exit out of Club Corner, the run down to Abbey was absolutely like a lake. And uh, quite simply, just finding traction at any speed, let alone at race speed, was uh, very difficult indeed. As again, back onto Wellington Street, you can see the centre to the right of your picture, the track is still definitely wet under braking into Brooklyn and uh, much easier corner because it's a very late apex than the short run down into the double left or right hander at Luffield. Key of course is stay away from those painted white and red curbs at this point. Something else that was apparent this morning because I had a lap round the circuit was how much rubbish if you like that was still on the circuit from yesterday chunks of rubber uh, from earlier races and earlier qualifying sessions of yesterday. Let's go to the pit lane and join Jack Nichols, who is with Alvaro Parent. Alvaro, what's the strategy then with qualifying, with the Q1 being in such damp conditions? Right, so uh, obviously damp conditions. The track will probably be better uh, at, right at the end of Q3. So uh, that's when you want to be at your uh, at your maximum attack and uh, and best uh, car setup. Uh, that's what we're aiming for. Uh, we opted to Alex Prema to start Q1. Greg's going to go on Q2, see if he can get some laps in the slicks. And then I'm going to go for, uh, for Q3 and see what's possible. So do you think Q1 is pretty much a, a sort of a waste of time because the lap times are not going to be there? At the beginning, no. I think the lap time is going to be right at the end. So, uh, so you've got to be ready for that moment. Thank you. Thanks. And under the regulations, you have to go out in Q1. The cars that are sitting in the pit lane are the two driver entries. Uh, they, of course, can't go out in Q1 because you have a nominated driver for Q2 and Q3. Uh, but under the regulations, the car must go out, barring force majeure, in each part of a session. Uh, fastest at the moment is the Ferrari number 11 of Mikhail Brozniewski, who was uh, pretty quick at Monza in the equivalent session and looked quite good. And he is fastest, but a 2.15, much, much slower, of course, than yesterday in the bone dry. Yeah, and what we're seeing just simply are everybody going out doing their outlap, exploratory yeah. lap, getting a sense, feel for what the racetrack has got this morning and then going back into the pits and saying, it's terrible, there's no grip. <laughs> As we watch the Ferrari come through, that's at the exit of Brooklyn's, Freddie Kramer, gentleman's trophy. And uh, again, in really, it doesn't matter whether you're a gentleman or a professional driver, these conditions are very, very difficult. It's not really sufficiently wet for a wet weather tower, but it's too wet to run a slick. Ideally, you would like an intermediate, but we don't use intermediates, which is actually, I think, a very good thing. Yeah. Because either you make a decision to take the chance and go on your slicks and, and just drive around and wait for the track to come to you, or you use the wet weather tyre, and in the process, you wear them out very quickly. Gentlemen, trophy Audis at play here. Jean-Luc Blanchemin is ahead of the Team Parker racing car with Ian Loggy at the wheel of it. Uh, the man in a big hurry at the moment, though, is somebody new to the championship in an Aston Martin. Paul Wilson, who's been a Caterham champion, there he is, has done an absolute best and a personal best across sectors one and two. This car had a spin yesterday. It's run by Stuart Leonard's team, another former Caterham racer, rival to Paul Wilson. It's got Johnny Adam in it as the third driver, but Paul Wilson has just gone quickest of all, 2.11.410. This could be a dark horse for a decent finish in the Pro Cup. Well, if you think back to last year when the golf sponsored Aston Martin, Darren Turner, uh, amongst others, dominated the race. And, in fact, during some of the wet practice sessions, uh, there, is that our friend in the... It is indeed. It is number 333 from Monza. But... And he's on the wet part of the track, too. But it's not yet, I hate to tell you, Vadim Kogai. He's, no. he's keeping dry his powder, ready for Q2. Uh, so it is Renat Sodikov in the car at the moment, and Vadim Kogai will take the stint in Q2 and uh, will be a man to watch. He's raced here before, Vadim Kogar. He was here last year in the International GT Open Series, but this is his co-driver, uh, Renat Sodikov. And then you get Marco Seafried in for Q3. We know from Monza that Seafried is very, very fast. Absolutely, Seafried did a very, very good job indeed. 
But just going back to the uh, Mark Bassang, just as we speak, has now improved on the time of the Aston Martin of Wilson. So uh, gap is at what, 0.373 of a second, and we're going to see now by the lap, but with only just under six minutes of the session remaining, just stay out yeah. and try and get some heat into those uh, Pirelli tyres, because otherwise you're going to be in and out of the pits, and you're going not, not going to get a time. That's the Bentley that's run by the Generation Bentley Racing Team. It's driven by Steve Tandy, a very successful historic racer who in the last few years has turned his attentions back again to modern GT racing. And this is a car that he shares with James Appleby and J.D. Fallon that runs in British GT. Now, next week, there is a three-hour British GT round here and a few of the teams coming to do this race to get some mileage in for testing for next weekend. Uh, Steve Tandy with a good pedigree in historic racing. Tremendous bloke, great enthusiast, and he's the man behind the wheel at the moment. And in fact, this car was quicker than the two quasi factory cars, yes. which was very interesting because it is a part of the British GT Championship. Just as an indication of where competition in that championship lies, it is a very intense championship as well. Absolutely right. And you're looking at Steve Tandy there, number 200, working his way on his first proper flying lap of the session. You have to say, it's not painted up in a very Bentley esque sort of. <laughs> paint job, is it? No, but it draws attention to itself, I think. It is. I mean, it's a striking colour and uh, it's not to be missed. But it's a quick car. Yep. It doesn't matter what the colour of the paint is, it's a quick car. And uh, we saw how well they went at Monza and there must be pretty high hopes, I would have thought, for the works cars, some quite high works cars, this weekend. Joe Osborne in there, or not Joe Osborne driving the car, but the Aston Martin again, not the same one we were talking about. It's gone now quickest. Uh, Mark Poole behind the wheel. No, it's not. Yes, it is Mark Poole behind the wheel. So it's 209.270. So the lap times, literally by the lap, are beginning to approach. They're not going to get down to the 203s that I think we saw when the track was at its best on Saturday. Now, somebody else in a big hurry, as you look at the Bentley drivers preparing, is Stephen Jelly, uh, because he, in number 44, Aston Martin, had an off yesterday, but he's done the best of anybody in the first sector. James Nash, incidentally, number three Audi, has done the best of anybody in the middle sector. There is Stephen Jelly. Now, this is a car that is on a mission. It's fourth fastest at the moment. It's the Aston Martin run by David Bartram's motor base squad under the Oman Racing Team banner, shared by uh, Ahmad Al Harfi and Michael Kane. Stephen Jelly is now fifth in the times, but this is looking like a good lap. He's lost a bit of ground, though, in that middle sector, frustratingly. Yeah, a little bit wide, I think, coming through the uh, through Village. So I uh, didn't quite get the power down, and now uh, all the way down the Wellington Strait into Brooklands, and then the very short sprint again, the, just the, the little patches of dampness on different parts of the circuit, then the double right-hander at Lovefield, just trying to keep a constant arc and then feed the power in progressively. You can use a little bit of kerb on the outside, it's the, inner, it's the kerb on the inside of Lovefield, you really want to stay away from, and he comes across to Ryan, James Nash, quickest on a 206.26. And Stephen Jelly second, and he was 98 thousandths shy. Not a bad lap, that by Stephen Jelly. Mark Sang in the meantime, out in number one, lost ground in the middle sector as well, which of course is the sector that includes Vale and the twiddly bits at the end of it, and also Village, which is a tight section going into the loop. He's got behind him 55 Audi, which is the Brothers Racing Team car, operated by uh, Team Parker Racing. And over the timing line then goes number one, Mark Bassang, and the lap time is a better one, but he keeps him seventh fastest. Yeah, I think just as a matter of traffic. I mean, you can see the, the, the amount of traffic that's on yep. the circuit. That's probably the best part of the, the 44 car grid that's here. So we get, and another Aston, I mean, it's as if Aston Martins have been hiding away, and all of a sudden, come Silverstone, they pop out. Number 38 in sixth place. They're kind of becoming, aren't they, the pro-am car of choice now, because they're easy-ish for the gentleman racers, whereas a couple of years ago people thought, must get a McLaren, but they weren't really the car for the gentleman racers, the ams to have. These cars have taken over in that vein. It's a very good car, and we don't see enough of them, and when they come to Silverstone, as we saw last year, very competitive, they won yeah. the race comfortably. So Mark Paul over the timing line, he's got quickest! 2 minutes 6.283, Mark Paul is a dark horse. Uh, he has Another done a lot of... British GT champ uh, yeah. championship competitor. But first year in that championship, first full season, he's done a lot of brick car. He's won here in the 24 hours of the 1,000k brick car races, but Mark Poole is a lot better than people give him credit for. So he's the quickest. Stephen Jelly is on a mission. He's done an absolute and a personal best. Andrew Smith has gone second for a curious cost, 36 thousandths of a second shy of Mark Poole. This is quite a session. 
drying track. Yeah. Restricted amount of time, under a minute of the session remaining. So in your last lap in this 15-minute session is going to be your quickest lap. And news from the pits is that the first rather brave car to go onto slicks is the Boots and Gini on McLaren number 16. But with 43 seconds to go, I would imagine that's just getting it onto slicks ready for Q2. They won't have time to go out and do an outlap uh, and get around and do a flying lap before the end of the session. So I think that's just the team bailing out early and getting ready for Q2. Half a minute of the session remains. Now there, different livery this weekend, but it's the Santilock Audi that finished in second spot at Monza. Stefan Ortelli is at the wheel of it. The car is seventh fastest. It looks a bit anonymous, doesn't it, in that paper? It does, but Stefan Ortelli, you would imagine, is going to be on a, a good lap. Yeah. So let's come and see where this car is going to come across. Start finish line, currently ninth, Stefan Ortelli in the white Audi. You don't see very many white Audi. He didn't really make any small improvement up to fifth. So he's fine time, and he's got one more lap because he yeah. came across start finish line, proud of the chequered flag going out. Fast stop still. Oh, oh in the gravel. That's, That's one of the yeah, McLaren's. Put some junior on car. So, number 15 it is. It's buried, it ain't getting out of there, guys. You're going to have to pull that out with a... Red flag. Yep. Interesting, yep. 16 seconds to go. The session has gone red, even though you can't see it on the start line. There is a red flag on the screen. And we're being told that the McLaren has hit the barriers at pit entrance. Like really? another shot of that. Well, but I, mean, I, I was trying to work out whereabouts, whereabouts on the circuit yeah. it is. I mean, coming out of Luffield, people tend to boot it mm. and then diagonally shoot into the, the pit lane entrance. There's the red flag being waved. There we are, coming out of the exit of Luffield. And if you catch the curb, I was talking about the curb. And where is that McLaren? The session has ended. Yeah. Let's look and well, see. Well, that's not pit entrance, that's Beckett's, isn't it? Yeah, so. that's up. Oh, there's a, there, yes, it's in the first part of Beckett's. And he's, pro he's left. And has he, it was just sideswiped, so there's not really much damage to the car. Yeah. But uh, it's caught in a part where it's a danger because mm. the car is not going to be moved easily. It needs a, a, a tractor to pull that car to safety as we get now four or five or six, I can't work out how many of the corner workers and marshals remove that car, push it to hard ground to enable it to get back to the pits. And right at the very end, Andrew Smith, for a curious cost, went the fastest, 2 minutes 6.130. Mark Poole's Aston Martin second, 2 minutes 6.283. And Mark Basseng's Audi, 2 minutes 6.369. Those times, in a sense, are going to be academic because the track will get drier yep. quicker and the cars get lighter, of course, for the next session and lighter still for Q3. Interestingly, in 12th place, Nick McMillan in one of the Nissan GTRs had fastest first sector at the point when the flight, when the flag went, so he had to back out of it. In fact, he got through to the second sector, and then, of course, he was then into the zone where the red flag was out, he had to back out of it. So what would have been with the Nissan, we don't know. I'm still slightly puzzled as to the information of a car hitting the barriers at Pit in, but anyway, the car in question is at Beckett's. There is the man that's... Ah, interestingly, the timing screen has switched itself to put Mark Poole back to the top. Have we just told you Andrew Smith had gone fastest? Because, I suspect, the lap that the flag went out on, the red flag went out on, anybody who just completed that lap or was completing it, wouldn't, it wouldn't count. So they will go back one lap. I'm assuming that's the, uh, the rationale behind that. So Andrew Smith's second best lap was a two minute 6.319, which puts him second. So Mark Poole, the fastest. Interesting that the British drivers, British teams are doing a strong job. And then Mark Bassane third. It's not really surprising. They're accustomed, A, to the circuit, which really isn't a big deal because any professional driver is going to be very quickly accustomizing to any racetrack. It's the conditions, the temperature, the, 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 the amount of water or moisture on the circuit. They know this because they're racing here or in Britain day in, day out. So they can make assessments, which are maybe slightly more knowledge-based than some of the European-based teams that are coming here just for once a year. So down at the pit lane, the driver changes take place to get your nominated Q2 driver aboard. And those that have done their work for now take off the crash helmet, get ready to walk away and study the data. Looking at Sport Garage, I think, there, with the driver change in the Ferrari. Michel Alba has done, Stefan Lemeray gets in. Eventually, it did need mechanical 
mechanism to bet that McLaren pulled to safety, so that car probably is not going to get back to the pit lane, and therefore, consequently, it is not going to be able to continue in this session, and probably not in any other session either, the remaining third session. Well, let's have a quick look at how we stand after Q1. Mark Poole, the fastest in the Mark Poole Motorsport AMR Aston. Two minutes, 6.283, ahead of Andrew Smith, Securia Cost BMW, Mark Bassang third, and then Stephen Jalley's Aston Martin fourth, ahead of Stefan Ortelli, and then James Nash sixth. Then it, it was Sun Zheng seventh. Paul Wilson, a good effort, eighth, ahead of Hubert Haupt, Michel Albert tenth, Nick McMillan eleventh in the Nissan with potential, and Michaela Ciaruti rejoins the series for Royal Motorsport, and he's twelfth in the BMW Z4. After that, you can see the spread of cars. Ferraris, then a whole chunk of McLarens, although the ART Grand Prix car of Andy Suchek only 15th, and Alex Premat struggling 16th. But we've seen in the past, McLarens don't always like the wet weather. Harold Primat's Mercedes, 18th. Ben Schneider's name you'll find in Q3 against that car. Good to have him back because Max Buch is in the ADAC GT Masters this weekend and indeed won in that series yesterday. And then lower down the order, you can see that the Bentleys have been struggling a bit this morning with the number eight Antoine Leclerc car only 26th fastest. But as I've been saying, this isn't going to affect the grid particularly. It will get drier, it will get quicker, and we look forward shortly to Q2 getting underway. Thirty-eight cars we saw in that session. More, of course, to join in uh, as we get to Q2, and it's busier. I'm very mystified as to why Guy Smith Bentley was penultimate, though. That may just have been an installation lap, and don't worry about it because they are looking forward to a drier session rather than risking the car in the wet. Well, we shall find out. Uh, we've seen Mark Poole out, and his co-driver Richard Abra, who is another real gun around here, is eagerly awaiting his turn. He's in the pits with Jack Nichols. Richard, what are the track conditions like out there? Um, it's drying, as best I can say. Uh, every lap was getting quicker and quicker. Um, traffic was a bit of an issue in that session for me, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's patchy and drying, so uh, I'm sure it'll be completely dry for Q3, for sure. Do you, what, what are your aims for this weekend? Do you think you can keep up towards the top of the timesheets? Yeah, I don't see why not. It's a home track, you know, all three drivers are pretty dialed in. Um, we came second here last year, so we want to kind of keep that momentum going forward. There's few, fewer entries this year, but competition is pretty fierce, so um, we won't see where we are in the race. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks. Right, the timing screen lied to us throughout Q1. Um, it wasn't Mark Poole in the car, it was that man, Richard yep. Abra. Yep. So apologies, but uh, the timing screen was telling us fibs, and it's down to the team to put the little transponder setting in the right place, so we can always blame the teams. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a team issue that they either forgot, or maybe water got into the works, because very often water does get into the works. Transponders don't like it, and um, maybe it was feeding incorrect information, but certainly a strong run as we we're confirming, I think, in the first commentary of this first part of qualifying, that the local drivers, it's the conditions that we've got right now that are really playing to their strengths. Once everything stabilises, hopefully the ambient and track temperature are going to come up, they are being forecast to do so, then that will then sort of balance out the advantage that the home drivers, the home brew drivers, currently are holding. Well, this is a look at the earlier parts of Q1. The number three Audi, James Nash, at the wheel of it. And you can see where the puddles were. James Nash was quick early on, so was this car in the hands of Paul Wilson, new to block pan, but looking very impressive indeed. And the Aston Martin, what convinced he's going to be a race-winning car in this team's hands, but it's going to be fascinating to see how it gets on, particularly in Q3 when you put Johnny Adam behind the wheel. And this was Richard Abra, as we now know. Same sentence that I used about Mark Poole. He is somebody else who is much underrated, and Richard Abra is a quick driver, that's for sure. He's been successful in Brick Car in the Aston Martin Challenge and now British GT as well. And that was the demise of 15 that had its big spin at the Beckett's S's. And it was Karim Auger down to do the driving in Q1. So this is the car that's fastest then, 38 Aston Martin with uh, Richard Abra having done the time. Now let's go to the pit lane and catch up with Steph Dusseldorp and news he is with Jack. Steph, you're going to be out in uh, Q3. That's the important one, isn't it? It's all down to you, really, because the track's drying. Yeah, the track is drying up quite quickly, uh, so the grip will improve every lap by lap. Probably the last lap will count, and uh, yeah, it will be very close with everyone on new tyres, and it's uh, going to be exciting. Is the Mercedes strong here? Yeah, it's, it's, it's OK. I don't think it's, uh, it's a specialty for every car. I think everyone can do very good. It's all about the, the, the very perfect lap, and uh, 
Ah, it's, it's okay. I think we can do well. Cool. Thank you. I think one of the differences of Monza, for example, and Silverstone is Monza is really more about today point and squirt mm. because you've got Parabolica, which is probably the principal corner. All the other corners are slower than they are at Silverstone or something like Curva Grande, which isn't really a corner, it's a curve. So you've got high-speed corners starting with cops, then that Beckett sequence all the way down to Stowe, and then from coming out of club through Abbey, then through Adelaide, I mean, really quick corners. So it's going to be about which car is going to generate good downforce, good balance, uh, but of course also good top speed. Now there's a car that we didn't see in the race at Monza. In fact, it's a replacement car for the one that was badly damaged at Monza, the Insight Racing Ferrari. Yep. Remember, qu crashed early on in the weekend, and so uh, Dennis Anderson and Martin Jensen have got another new Ferrari 458, and we wish them better fortune for this weekend, the very enthusiastic Danish team. Well, let's say they remember the Lesmo corners, and uh, Lesmo 2 is where they got caught out as a big impact on the inside of the exit of that corner, and the damage to the car clearly was severe. Hopefully there's more space here at Silverstone, I think that there is. Nevertheless, because of the nature of the corners, being fast corners, you, you can travel farther if you do get it wrong. There's loads and loads of runoff here, and track limits is an issue here, particularly with people have been warned about it over the course of the weekend, all that very inviting tarmac to run wide onto. So we should expect times better than the 2 minutes 6.283 that we had in Q1. There goes number 17, Ferrari. Dennis Anderson at the wheel of it. There is an example of people running the curb on the exit of Cops Corner. But that's not really the problem corner. The problem corner is the exit of Club Corner mm. onto what would be the Grand Prix start-finish straight. And people have a habit of running not just two wheels, but sometimes four wheels, and sometimes actually are so far off track that they are gaining a distinct advantage off the corner. And that's where the track limits the respect of the track limits is going to be most focused. Car one, please check transponder. Because it's shown as having Mark Bassang behind exactly. the wheel, which it shouldn't have. It so should now be Cesar Ramos. Yes, it should be Cesar Ramos. And Laurence Van Four will jump into that car for the final 15 minutes, at which point, as Steph Dusseldorf indicated, the track should be at its best. But with a field of over 40 cars all thinking, ah, the last session is going to yeah. be the quickest, will we put on our best tyres? We might be quick, well, with over 40 cars on the racetrack at the same time, finding that lap is going to be the trick. Yeah, it's the last session, it'll be the last lap of the session, conceivably, when it's even drier, but at the moment it is 43 that has set the benchmark time, which is Eugenio Amos, 2 minutes 4.9 as the first stab that he's given. Yeah, and already, I mean, that's the best part of two seconds quicker in lap time than we've seen in the previous, or in the first, of these three qualifying sessions. So the track conditions do change, and once the track begins to dry up and people then get the confidence to go out on a set of slick tyres, you can see the dry liners on screen on the left coming down, the bit on the right, that's wet, and if you're on slicks, you do want to go near it. Alison McKay was second, but Kevin Astra has now gone quickest in the ART Grand Prix McLaren, continuing to prove, as he did last year at uh, Baku, that he's not just a Porsche specialist, he can do it in any GT car, and he's been quick around here in GT3 and Porsche Super Cup over the years, so he knows Silverstone pretty well. Kevin Est is for ART Grand Prix now, 1.9 seconds quicker than anybody else, although Frankie Cheng has just done the best of anybody in the first sector, uh, so he's on a mission. Uh, Andy Merrick has gone second in Bentley number 7, the Insight Racing team are just hoping to get through qualifying, I think, without any real scares here for the Ferrari. One of the observations I had from Monza, just talking to some of the other competitors, is how good the Bentley is with traction. Mm. And they uh, were quite impressed with the ability of the Bentley, which it is a physically large car, but it gets its power down extremely yeah. well. And you're riding on board number seven Bentley. This is Andy Merrick. It's a good right-hand drive car, lots of left-hand drive. GT cars, Aston Martins included, but it's a right hooker, and you're riding then with Andy Merrick, ignore the caption, it's Andy Merrick at the wheel. Now this is the edge of the club corner, and there is the outside of the corner, you can see the AstroTurf, which uh, is the demarcation, as it pulls up, accelerates down the inside into Abbey, you know, brave move, and probably under temperature tyres, but uh, the Bentley handling well, Andy Merrick using a bit of steering effort to try and keep the car balanced, but fundamentally, uh, the car looks good. And how do you describe what it's hanging on to? Is that a full wheel? 
it's an excuse for a steering wheel. <laughs> but it, it, well, the steering wheel is only one part of what the steering wheel does. It's yeah. a communication centre, it's, a, it's a, an IT centre, it's a computer in itself. But it does look slightly out of place in a car as magnificent as the Bentley Continental. You're right. But all the buttons all to do different things, and he's working his way through traffic. John's made the point about how busy the circuit is, and it's a graphic illustration here. Andy Merrick hard at work, up towards the timing line. Really fighting the car there, up through the gears. He goes second fastest on that lap, 2 minutes 3.161. So it's Kevin Est ahead of Andy Merrick. Despite the traffic, he goes second. That's a good effort. It's a very good effort because there's a lot of traffic around and having to sort of filter your way through all that traffic and keep your momentum uh, is not easy. And this is what's good to see. Just over seven minutes remaining as he goes through the complex up at Beckett's through the left-hand part, then slow the car down again to exit, then you go through Chapel Curve, back onto Hangar Straight. It's Eugenio Amos in the BMW that won Pro-Am at Monza. He was quick early on in the session, but he's dropped down the order a bit now to 10th overall, the former Lamborghini racer and salesman and Ferrari racer. Eugenio Amos, new to BMWs this year, coming through the loop now. He's got Alistair McKay ahead of him, but he runs a little bit wide there. Yeah, it was slightly... The, the, just I'm watching a number of drivers coming through Village are not quite getting the car into the corner as they would like to do. Well, that's because of just track conditions or whether they can't get tire temperature. And of course, consequently, they lose time and they off run off that, then through Adelaide, then all the way down the Wellington Strait. Alessandro Bonaccini's Ferrari has just gone second fastest. Nico Verdonk's Mercedes has gone third, which is interesting because the Mercedes didn't really shine at Monza. Good to see the cars going well around here. And we haven't really had too much success from Mercedes in previous long pound races here either. Over the line goes Eugenio Amos. Let's just see what that lap is. It's sixth, it's a good effort, puts him sixth fastest. Still Kevin Estra is top, but he's now only 78 thousands up on Bonaccini. There's 107 Aston Martin heads for the timing line and goes fastest of all the Beach Dean car in the hands of Alex McDowell, new to the car, world touring car racer, puts the Aston Martin to the top. Very confident in the car using the curb on the approach into Cops. Again, where these curbs are still going to be moisture on them, uh, but he had the confidence to do so going into to Cops on that run. And this is 99 McLaren. Which is Kevin Estra. Through again, Kevin Estra back to the top. He yep. was briefly uh, second. He's now fastest, 2 minutes 2.011. And Andy Merrick has gone second behind him on a 2.2.248. So the two British cars, there they are together, first and second in the times. Yeah, so looking at Kevin Estra turning into, into Cops, very aggressive, very sharp turn. The McLaren, of course, is a car that is very good at that entry point into a corner, but Kevin Estra using it to take a late apex into Cops, being chased by the Bentley. The gap between the two is just a quarter of a second. Now, we don't see many Porsches, much of the frustration of John, but this is a quick car. Oh, and a spin behind from the TDS BMW. Henry Hassid has lost it. He actually let the Porsche go through, so he must have gone offline, got moisture on his tyres, he's just driven through the grass, got more moisture on the tyres, too much throttle, and in the meantime, Mark Bassang has gone into third quickest position, three-tenths of a second away from Kevin Astor. For which reason, says our Ramos, because they've still got that transponder in the wrong place, haven't they? Yeah, on that have car, yeah. You're right. are. It is. You're right, it's the Bassang car. Now, this is Eric Demont heading up towards the timing line in number 93 Porsche, which, of course, is a two-driver entry, so it doesn't do Q1. It's the first time we've seen it on track today. And over the timing line, it has gone. That actually was a quick car in practice yesterday, Yeah. in spite of the weather conditions, and I was getting all excited about the fact <laughs> that maybe Porsche are going to be competitive there. We see the BMW again. Just simply, he pulled off line, let the Porsche go through, and it must be damp on the inside, because that was just sort of a very uh, basic back-end breaking away. Yeah, we don't have a Porsche in the Pro Cup, but that's one of the examples from Pro-Am, the Eric Demont car. There is Bentley 7 once again. Andy Merrick did the best of anybody in Sector 1 on this lap, but he lost a little bit of time in Sector 2. So what can he do in the third sector? Here he is, hard at work, fighting the car, coming out of Luffield, a man from Chester in the northwest of England, heads up towards the timing line. The man to beat is Kevin Ast. He's got to find over two tenths of a second. He comes across the line, and it's a slightly slower lap in the end. Yeah, and there's what draw about hundreds of a second down and that's simply just down to traffic and he's doing the right thing he's staying out doing the laps got just under, over three minutes of the session remaining as we watch car 
26, the Audi that was driven by Ortelli, not been driven by Ortelli at the minute. Edward Sandstrom, middle of Sandstrom indeed. And we've had Eric Dermont and Eugenio Amos with a lap time deleted for exceeding the track limits at Turn 1, which is this corner here. Turn 1 in old money is Cops. Yeah, he must have had all four wheels off the exit. There you see the red and white line, then the astral turf behind it. If you get all four wheels over that, that will, be, that will cut. And the track limits... Uh, in fact, it's happened. Turn 1 for the both cars. Yeah. Now, there's 11 Ferrari, which is going strongly, with Alessandro Bonaccini going fastest, 2 minutes 1.819. Briefly, Cesar Ramos had gone top, but as he came over the line, Bonaccini was behind him, and it is the Ferrari that goes fastest by a tenth of a second. So we're gradually, gradually getting close to the stage. We're going to see this in just over a few minutes' time in the next and final session with drivers, and maybe the quickest of the three drivers in the professionally driven cars, particularly. Got a fresh set of rubber as the Mercedes runs very, very wide and consequently loses track position. The Bentley gets through cleanly, so that will be a small result, undoubtedly, for uh, Andy Merrick. Yeah, that was Afanasiev, said I, Afanasiev with the Mercedes getting it slightly wrong. And as we have the cars then with a minute and three quarters of this middle part of qualifying still to go. Fastest of all is Alessandro Bonaccini. Now there's 35 Nissan, which is looking pretty strong in Pro Am. 12 fastest. Miguel Faisu is the man at the wheel of it. Now he crashed on Friday in the bronze test on his outlet, out of the pits, and he got as far as Beckett's. And Ricardo Zacco played into the wall and did about 50 k's worth of damage. And it had to go to a body shop overnight to be rejigged, ready for yesterday. So. Miguel Faisha back on track and looking a lot stronger today. Yeah, they did a lot of damage to the actual chassis itself. One of the chassis legs that sticks out, which is part of the deformable structure of a race car, as well as a production car, uh, had to be straightened out. So it was a, a, an all-nighter yeah. for the team, the Nissan team, to get that car repaired, get it back to the circuit, which they did for Saturday. The team run by Bob Neville, who, in spite of all of that, never shouts and screams. And as the car was brought back, and I said, how are you, Bob? He said, terrible. But he didn't get all cross with his driver, he just sort of accepted it and got on with the next job in hand, which was to rebuild the car. 44 Aston Martin goes through, which has, for this session, got Ahmad al Harfi at the wheel of it, the Oman driver. And he's a very quick driver, class winner here last year in a Porsche, don't forget, when he shared with Mira Konopka in the ARC Bratislava Porsche. The Aston Martin, just watching the, sort of, the body language of these cars, disregarding the colours of the different team entrance here. The car looks particularly coming through club. The back end sort of squats. It gives that kind of bite and grip and ultimately the confidence that uh, a driver needs. And to be able to commit, to be able to throw the car, we're riding on board now with the Aston down the Wellington straight up to about 250 or so kilometres, maybe 260, just under 160 miles an hour. And then down through the gears, turning to Brooklands. Checkered flag is out. And Alessandro Bonaccini ends Q2 as the fastest. It's all building up nicely for good Q3, isn't it, this? Another instance we're being told for Eugenio Amos of a lap time deleted. So the BMW driver is in a bit of strife here, as up to the time in line comes Ahmad al Hafi. He is currently 13th fastest. Is this going to be an improvement for him? He comes over the line, he's taken the flag, he goes slightly slower. So the Aston stays 13th in Q2. Well, it just goes to prove that looks don't mean quickness, don't mean speed. But the Aston Martins, in general, I think look very good, very driver-friendly. And that Kevin Estra has actually eclipsed on that last lap, so Kevin Estra is back at the top of the timing and scoring with a time 2 minutes 01.653, a tenth and a bit quicker than we saw from the Ferrari. So Bonaccini drops to second, and Andy Merrick's Bentley is third, and it's Ramos, Sandstrom and Nico Verdon. This is Edward Sandstrom, who has backing from the computer games market, and it's a different game that he's advertised on the car this weekend, but he comes to the pit lane. It still looked very anonymous to me, that car, but anyway, I'm sure in the race it will draw attention to itself by speed. Yeah, we're just so used to seeing WRT Audis and that paint scheme that they've so successfully uh, used, and then, oh, and there is an Audi. One of the gentleman driver cars stuck. I'm just trying to see where that is. I think, oh, it's just coming out of... It's going... Did he make a mistake in the middle of club corner? Somehow he's ended up on the inside of the racetrack. Yeah. Jean-Claude Lanier, the stuntman, is the man in question. 
sort of stuntman can get himself out of trouble, but Lanier's in strife in the Vale at the end of the session. So we've also had a report that the 888, 888 BMW, 888 the number and the team, has had a spin. Derek Johnston was the man behind the wheel, but survived the experience. Down the pit lane comes number eight, Bentley, which the former Grand Prix racer Jerome D'Ambrosio has had in that session for eighth fastest. Katzberg takes the flag, uh, sorry, Henry Hassid, I should say, takes the flag, and then behind the Acuria Cost BMW, Alistair McKay got the wheel of it, 18th fastest. I thought Ahmad Al Halfi had taken the flag, but there he is, still pounding on. I think he's heading for the pits this time. He should do. And then down the pit road to get ready for Q3. 42 Ferrari behind from Sport Garage. That's the car of Stefan Lebre, the Belgian journalist. I just wonder, oh, the Ferrari, I thought it was going to go on another lap, but it didn't. It's pulled in. Uh, just a late cut again as people come out of Luffield, they make that cut as late as possible to get the maximum speed in. Yes. The Ferrari by Rinaldi, GT course by Rinaldi. So, the time's done, Kevin Est, the fastest, 2 minutes 1.653, ahead of Alessandro Bonaccini, 2 minutes 1.819, and Andy Merrick third in the Bentley, 2 minutes one. 0.835. He does seem to be at the moment the benchmark driver in a Bentley GT car because he was so good Absolutely. at Monza. Absolutely, Monza was extremely good in well that opening stint, that one-hour stint. Ran second place on merit, and then gradually, as the race progressed, they dropped further down the field. But very impressive run. So this is how it looks in Q2. Kevin Est tops the times from Alessandro Bonaccini and then Andy Merrick in a car that was really struggling in Q1, so proof that it's OK now. They were keeping their powder dry. Ramos fourth for Audi, Sands from fifth for Audi, Nico Verdonk's Mercedes sixth ahead of Alex McDowell, Jerome D'Ambrosio, Frank Stippler only ninth, Jody Fannin first time out of the Bentley tenth, interesting, ahead of Eugenio Amos and then uh, Sergei Afanasiev. Thirteenth is where you find the Scuderia Viroba Ferrari of Stefano Gai. Out qualifying Ahmad Al Hafi and then behind Frankie Chang a bit further back than anticipated. Miguel Faisha 16th in the end, ahead of Alessandro Sonvico, Alistair McKay 18th, 19th, Stefan Lemare, and 20th after his spin, Henry Hassid. Gregoire de Moustier only 21st, ahead of Benjamin Lariche, and then Derek Johnston, despite a spin, first time out in block pan, 23rd, with Abdulaziz Al Faisal, 24th in the Black Falcon, Mercedes number 19. The number 80 Nissan, not quite so strong in Q2. That car 25th with Florian Strauss at the wheel, ahead of Eric Dermont. Then Stuart Leonard 27th, the Graf Racing Porsche of Eric Trillier 28th, ahead of Freddie Bath, Mark Poole 30th. And then the Team Parker Racing Audi comes in the Gentleman Trophy next at 31st, ahead of the Matchel Schmickler Ferrari. John Marc Bachelier 33rd, Guy Vietz 34th, Felipe Barreros 35th and Sergio Laboda is 36th, and still there are more times to come, such as the size of the engine. The Insight Racing Ferrari, 37th. 38th is where you find the repaired number 16, McLaren after earlier dramas. Vadim Kogai, 39th, Jean-Claude Lanier with his spin, 40th, ahead of Paul Bailey, Georges Caban. Marcus May makes his Blancpain debut, 43rd, and Oliver Grutz, 44th, in that car that suffered damage in the earlier session, both in the gravel at Beckett and by scraping down the pit barrier uh, earlier on in the session. Right, two down, one to go, 15 more minutes. This is when we will see the grid. So we will have the times being established really for the grid in this drier part of qualifying. Made the point the cars are at their lightest. If the teams feel they can do it, they will put a new set of slips onto them and then we'll be ready to go as we look at some of the highlights of Q2 that began with the Insight Racing Ferrari looking strong in the hands of Dennis Anderson, the new flexbox car to replace the one damaged at Monza. Andy Merrick was charging on in the Bentley. Early on in the session, he was looking strong, then he found himself in traffic, but even that didn't phase him. He was still able to carve his way through and post good lap times. Third at the end of Q2 for the Bentley driver. A spin for Henry Hassett's BMW coming out of the loop. That delayed him slightly. But then the quick Ferrari in the hands of Alessandro Bonaccini pounded out of Woodcut Corner and put itself up to the top of the times, but briefly. At the very end, though, Kevin Est was the man that went even faster and got himself up to the top of the times. The ART Grand Prix McLaren is still looking as rapid and as competitive as it was at Monza a couple of weeks ago.
So that is Silverstone's impressive wing. And very shortly, we will be underway for this third part of qualifying. It's another 15 minutes, and this really is where the grid starts to take shape. And the way that Kevin Esther was going, he now hands over that car to Kevin Coyus, the ex-Formula Renault 2-litre and 3.5 racer. It's up to him to take on teammate Alvaro Parent. And I've got a feeling that I'd still put my Euros on Parent for pole. I would do too, and I think uh, Alvaro Parent in any car these days is sort of almost cash in the bank in terms of expectation and performance. But look, you can see around the racetrack that there is a substantial amount of wind. Uh, while well, that's all helping dry the circuit out, it's also keeping the ambient temperature as well as the track temperature down. And those young race fans sitting there, keeping in some shade and shelter, just trying to stay warm. I mean, it looks magnificent. You just don't realize that currently it's little more than 11, 12 degrees or 12 Celsius. Hopefully that is going to increase by the time we get to the start of the race, just before 3 o'clock this afternoon. And then it'll be three hours of uh, GT racing around the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. Right now it looks a picture, doesn't it? Mm. Exactly, and this is a circuit very popular with the teams because of not just the history of Silverstone, but the mix of corners, the new corners that were introduced a few years ago have been a big hit with everybody, makes for spectacular racing and a few more overtaking opportunities as well, and places where you can make mistakes, which again spice up the races. We saw spins in that second qualifying session, we'll see drama no doubt at the loop come the race itself this afternoon. The green flag is waved, the pit lane will empty of every car that is fit and ready to go. And this is going to be a very crowded house. Anybody that strings together a good lap here and doesn't moan about traffic would have been a very lucky man. Yes, and it's just going to be the same story all over again. The track at its best now, just under 15 minutes of the session to go. And everybody, and probably the quickest of the three drivers, or in some cases two drivers, in any of the entrants are going to be out there looking for that clear lap to try and gain any advantage that's possible. It's just a lottery, really. With the number of cars on the circuit, you've just got to be very fortunate to get every part, every sector clear to enable you to get that one lap in. And also, it's the first flying lap, maybe in the, because the temperatures are a little bit low, maybe the second flying lap, that's going to be the best, because that is when the tyre gives its best performance. So you've got to not just find the clear bit of track, you've got to find it at a point when your tyres are going to be at their best performance. You can see the mix of brands that we have as well in the Blanc Pan Endurance Series. Nissan, Mercedes, BMW, Audi all making their way down towards Stoke Corner. And that's just a fraction of the entry, really. So many different shapes and sizes on the grid this year, which is great to see. And still it's damp offline. Still, it's not a totally dry Silverstone. But the drivers have got to get on with this and make the best out of it. And assuming they have been given a new set of slicks for this segment of qualifying, then the lap times will start to come at the end of the next lap. Ignore this one, the out lap is the next one, possibly even the one after when they're up to temperature, where we'll get those times. Lawrence Vantor drives Audi number one, he's a candidate for pole position. Christopher Meese, number three Audi, a candidate for pole position. And of course, the ART Grand Prix McLarens with Alvaro Parent at the wheel of number 98. And he will be hard to beat. We're also being shown 99 as having Andy Suchet behind the wheel, but I would question that. It's certainly not what the original list showed for qualifying, and we know that transponders can be a drama for some of the teams. Very complicated device, you know. So, onto a flying lap, they start to pour, and already we're down to 13 minutes of the session. The Curia Cost BMW is keen out every session, and Oliver Bryant goes through, being pursued by Joe Osborne there. Still, look at the crumbing that they come across, start, finish straight. There's still patches of dampness on the racetrack. So these drivers into this car, I mean, they're coming out stone cold, mm. as have their previous two, or in some cases, one co-drivers. But for the drivers in qualifying three, it's probably a bigger pressure because they know they're going to have to perform. So Oliver Bryant, who, again, familiar national-level motor racing, both in historic racing and in contemporary cars in the Acuria cars, BMW. They've got that window, a very narrow window, of about two laps where, if it's a new tyre, that tyre will give up of its best performance. Now there's the Aston Martin that makes its way down to the end of Vale. Joe Osborne at the wheel of it. Joe drove, of course, in this event last year with both Mark Paul and Richard Abbott in this car, so... They are a team that work well together. Ollie Brandt bails out, in fact, and lets the Aston go past on the run-up towards Abbey. It's going to be Joe Osborne, I think, to do the benchmark time, but it could be the last car through on the last lap, at least, where you get the best lap time. 
I think there's every chance that uh, we'll see a very strong lap time being established in the next couple of laps. It's just a question of whether track conditions over sort of over a, have a, a more powerful effect on lap times than the actual tyre condition, just simply because the track has improved, which may well be the case. It runs very, very wide coming through Adelaide. I mean, that's, that's tempting the, the, uh, the, the race director to say, mm. respect track limits. You're just getting to the stage where almost four wheels are off the racetrack. And of course, come the race, if you start getting stop-go penalties or time penalties for it, then it's a big drama. In qualifying, you will have, if you gain an advantage by doing it, your lap time deleted. That's not the end of the world. It doesn't help, but it's not the end of the world. But in the race, it's much more serious. So Joe Osborne goes through and does a 2 minutes 2.206. First effort offered up by the Aston Martin. Ten and a half minutes in the session to go. Waiting to see what a Lawrence Van Tour lap could be. But also, number 19 Mercedes looking pretty rapid at the moment. It's got Andreas Simonson behind the wheel of it. And that had done the best of anybody in the first sector. Well, Nick Katzberg now goes top. Though. Yeah, Nicky Katzberg on his first flying lap has uh, done the quickest lap so far, 201.243. And then is bested by Alex Buncombe in the Nissan number 80. Two minutes 1.243 goes to the top of the times. Simonson third, two minutes 2.179. And then look for the ART Grand Prix McLarens. 98 comes up towards the timing line then. So this is the Alvaro Parent car, which goes fastest of all. Two minutes 1.063. Best lap of the weekend. Yeah, but interestingly, the top four cars, certainly the top three cars, are all running pretty close. In fact, first and second car just almost two tenths of a second gap between uh, Alvaro Parent uh, and second place so how long can they sustain the tyre the, the tyre performance per se over improving track conditions wow that's not the way to come through and then runs off track down in the loop so that was just a little bit too much speed into the first part of that little complex that leads through Adelaide then flat out left hand corner easy to overrun on the exit down Wellington Strait Stefano Comandini the man at the wheel Lawrence Vantor has just gone four fastest and what's gone quickest of all John but Porsche exactly from Pereira to the top by a tenth I've been watching that car and I knew it was quick <laughs> trouble is it's got one pro and one am so straight away it's at a disadvantage because the bulk of the work has to be done by the am Alex Buncombe quick in the first sector quicker than anybody lost time in the middle yes but ran wide again cautious having to coming out of Adelaide so easy to overrun on the exit just to try and straighten the car up and maximize your speed so coming through double right hander at Luffield and just balancing the car on the throttle and the steering, a lot less movement on the wheel from Alex Buncombe in the Nissan than we were seeing from, was well, in the pit lane anyway, from Alex, uh, from uh, Andy Marrick in the previous session in the Bentley, where there's a lot more sawing at the steering wheel. Mick Katzberg pits as well as Lawrence Vantor comes through, done a personal best in sector one, he's in the middle sector now, that finishes coming out of Aintree. And we've had the best of anybody in the last sector just done by Greg Gilver for Santelok, who's gone fourth fastest. Vantor is on it. He's right on. I mean, really, at the very, very end of Abbey, managed to drop a wheel off the kerb, kicked up a bit of mud, which is B mud. So uh, Lawrence Vantor trying to go through Abbey as fast as that ID is capable of doing. And he knows that he's got to use the tyre as early as possible to try and get the, the best time he can. Alvaro Perez second. And uh, Alex Brundle, uh, Alex Brundle, <laughs> Alex Buncombe down to third place, but still holds that fastest first sector. Now Vantor currently is sixth because Joe Osborne has gone ahead of him fifth, two minutes, 1.931. Very wide in the car, almost snapped there. Lawrence Vantor, we said it was on it. You can see the commitment. He was down in the middle sector. He comes across the timing line and the lap does not actually post an improvement. Two minutes, 3.062. Lawrence Vantor, very highly regarded within WRT. Yeah, well, in fact, he's almost a second, a second a bit slower than yeah. his previous best. Marco Seafried now is the one to watch, potentially in the bright green Ferrari. This car draws attention to itself for different reasons, but when it's Marco behind the wheel, it's on speed. And he did a good job. Flashed the lights to give some warning to the to the Jaguar, a unique Jaguar GT3 car running for the first time in a very long time. But 
Siegfried gets through and uh, pretty much maintain the momentum. Hopefully, we'll see what time he's going to do. He's currently in 10th place on a 2.02.238. Stays there, passing the Jaguar, probably accounted for any loss of time. Now we could yet get a Porsche on pole because it's still front Pereira, but it's this man that's the danger. Alvaro Perent, personal best in sector one, lost a little bit of time in sector two. It seems to be the sentence we have for everybody at the moment. Very few people improve in that middle sector, but Perent's still looking quick. Stephen Kane's gone fifth in the Bentley number seven with the best of anybody in the last sector. Can we get Perent back to the top of the times? Well, I think the problem that Alvaro Perent is going to have to feel is that he's used the tyre and he's had the best of the tyre. Track conditions are improving, so it's an offset between the two. So can Alvaro Perent currently second to a 1.063? No, he hasn't. 2.0362. And that's, I suspect, traffic principally, yeah. uh, but maybe it's part of that tyre effect. But he's got time for at least two more laps, if the tyres will permit. Got Duncan Tappy up to 12, incidentally, now in Bentley 8, 2 minutes 2.090. And Stephen Kane, best of anybody in sector one. So the Northern Irishman, bear in mind, he blotted his copybook a bit in qualifying at Monza, aims to get the car right up here at Silverstone. As you look at the car that is currently on provisional pole position, it is from Pereira, who's done a 2 minute 0 0.912, the best lap of the weekend comes up towards the timing line. I don't think this will be an improvement because he lost out in both sectors one and two. But from Pereira, good single-seater race that comes through. Yeah, very slow lap in comparison. Four seconds slower than he was doing. But isn't it amazing? A 50-year-old design yeah. is still capable in its current guise of uh, outperforming the best of the rest of the GT cars in the world. Number seven, Stephen Kane in the Bentley, fastest Four. of all in sector one. We need to see what's coming through for sector two. Personal best. So we can see Stephen Kane elevating himself currently in seventh place, challenging potentially for the front row of the grid. Down to Brooklands then, he's in this last sector, starting on the second row, sorry, the third row, I should say, at the moment, on the inside of that third row, just ahead of Kevin Kouyos in the 99 McLaren. Here is Stephen Kane, hard at work. Up towards the timing line. His best is a 2-1-6-3-0. Where does this lap put him? It puts him third, 2 minutes 1.214. Starting on the second row of the grid is better than the front row. There's the sister car, number eight, Duncan Tappy behind the wheel. So Duncan Tappy will also need, suspect, 13th place in the grid. He needs to get a bit further up than that. Inter-team driver rivalry is always intense. But again, it's just a matter of where he is in the racetrack, traffic, how much tyre performance he's got left, looks very good through, and on the exit of Luffield comes out through Woodcut flam out in the Bentley and comes across start finish line stays 13th yeah. and the fastest car that of Front Pereira being warned about respecting track limits, no penalty heading his way but he's being warned about respecting the track limits, staying within the white lines BMW's looking quick, the 888 car there which is now in the hands of Ron Ratcliffe, last year's GT4 champion now that track is limits. It. That's abusing track limits. <laughs> That's like almost going to toaster. He nearly had to pay to get back in, Nick Katzberg there. Wide onto the curb at Abbey. That car's not shining in this session, strangely, because Katzberg is good. But it's not really clicked as yet. 11 fastest gets through on the inside of the number three, Christopher Meese. Audi, red flag. Session is stopped. Also, Ale oh, 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 there we and a big shunt. Back of the Ferrari and the nose of the Ferrari. In the meantime, Alex Buncombe has got the Nissan up yeah. onto the second row of the grid alongside Stephen Kane. That's coming through Vail, and it's hit the barrier. It's ended up on the track, that car, hence the red flag. Well, that's just on the exit, actually, out of Stoke Corner. It's the inevitable as you get to the very tail of Stoke Corner and you lose the back of the car. The car will go from left in a long spinning arc into the inside of the corner, and there you can see it's caught the tyre barrier and the, uh, the the binding that keeps those tyres together. That's a big hit. Session is over, it won't resume with two and a half minutes give or take to go. It's not worth restarting, so qualifying is done. It was Roman Brandella, incidentally, in the Ferrari that has caused the stoppage by having the accident. So Porsche pole from Pereira quickest. I don't want to say any more. Well, we didn't predict a Porsche, did we? We were thinking I, maybe I, Audi or McLaren. No, the Porsche Pierre Pereira was quick yesterday, and I went, 
what's happening? Why is the Porsche fast? <laughs> it may have been because of the circumstances, but on merit, he's there. He's a tenth of a second up on the on the Avaro Parent in the uber modern super yeah. model co carbon fiber shell. I mean, this is what the balance of performance does. But also a good driver in a competitive car in Blancpain can still have a virtuoso performance. That's what we've seen Frank Pereira do. So the cars make their way down the pit lane. Frank Pereira then is the fastest from Alvaro Parent, a tenth between them. And what we hadn't talked about was the gap between Alvaro Parent and Alex Buncombe, second and third. It is one thousandth of a second. That is how competitive Blancpain is, and that's how well the balance of performance works. A thousandth of a second split two cars. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, what can you say? It's very competitive. And this is how Q3 looks, and this is really effectively how the grid is going to be. Font Pereira ahead of Alvaro Parent, Alex Buncombe starting third ahead of Stephen Kane. Fifth is the Santa Lock Audi in the hands of Greg Gilbert ahead of Kevin Curios in the McLaren. Ben Schneider, seventh ahead of Joe Osborne's Aston. Laurence Vantour, only ninth ahead of Dan Lloyd, coming to Blancpain ahead of Mick Katzberg, and then Christopher Meese rounding out the top 12. 13th fastest is the second of the works Bentleys. This is in the hands of Duncan Tappy. That in turn is ahead of number 19 Mercedes, which was in the hands of Andrea Simonson. Francesco Castellacci, 15th ahead of Steph Dusseldorp. Oli Bryant's BMW, 17th. Marco Siegfried, only 18th ahead of Michael Kane and Katsumasa Chio. Andre Couto is 21st ahead of Stefano Comandini, Nicola Armindo, and James Appleby in the what you might call private Bentley is 24th fastest. 25th is the Kessel Racing Ferrari, Giacomo Petrobelli a bit further down than you might anticipate, ahead of Nico Maroc and then Francisco Guedes, Johnny Adams 28th ahead of Ryan Ratcliffe and Andy Schultz, then it is Martin Jensen ahead of Frank Schmickler with Gabriele Gardel's Jaguar, ahead of Julian Westwood's Audi, Roman Brandella's battered now Ferrari and Gilles Vanillet's sister car, 36th fastest. And then to complete the times at the end of Q3, 37th is where you find the AF Corsa Ferrari of Yannick Malagol, ahead of Pierre Hershey, and then the second of the Black Falcon Mercedes. Mark Sword, 40th, ahead of Stephen Earle, and barely doing a lap at all, Phil Quaife's McLaren from the Boots and Genial Racing Team. So there is Romain Brandella, who has some explaining to do, and this is the downside for the teams about having qualifying on the same day as racing, because they've got a lot of work to do now, ready for the afternoon. Yeah, and looking at the car, as we can see it on camera, the damage is primarily a, a bodywork rear wing. I doubt maybe there's anything more than that. Maybe it's just some suspension damage, but the, the protection down there is quite considerable, so the car would have bounced pretty much back onto the... Uh, well, the car came to rest, so I don't expect it to be too badly damaged. Hopefully it'll be repaired in time for just prior to 3 p.m. this afternoon start. Quick look back at some of the highlights of the session. The Acuria course BMW led the way out of the pits, but it wasn't long before Joe Osborne got the Aston Martin through the track position and then started putting quick lap times in the MP Motorsport car. This was the Stefano Comandini slide coming through Village and up towards the loop that he survived from. Alvaro Parent was able to get the McLaren to the top of the times, albeit briefly. And then others that were looking rapid was number one, Laurence Vantour at the wheel of the Belgian Audi Club Team WRT car and that ninth fastest in the end. But the car to beat in Q3 was the number 93 Porsche, Franck Pereira was the man behind the wheel and the session stopped early with 41 Roman Brandella having this accident and putting the car up against the wall. So that was the reason for the red flag. But round two of the Blanc Panic. It's goodbye.